Welcome to the College Investor Audio Show, where we talk about the biggest issues impacting millennial money, from student loan debt to side hustles to building wealth. We will show you how to get out of debt so that you can build real wealth for the future. Hey guys, it's Robert from The College Investor here, and today I am going to talk about a fun subject that I haven't covered a ton in depth on The College Investor, but it's been on my mind, and it is how to get started with house hacking and how you can use your house to start building real estate wealth. So on average, most Americans have their wealth by home ownership. Now, I personally do not view my home as an investment, and I don't think you should view your home as an investment either, because your home is just a place you live. It's not typically an investment for most people, but there are some ways that you can turn your house into an investment. And this is called house hacking. And if you are willing to house hack, you can make your home ownership catapult your net worth almost immediately. So what is house hacking, right? <clears throat> house hacking is the art of having tenants pay for your primary residence. So it's basically turning your home, your primary home, into a money-making machine that covers its costs, maybe even more. You could do that by renting out a spare bedroom. You could live in one part of the unit. If you have a multi-unit property, um, you could live have roommates there that pay for the rent. But if you choose an unconventional primary house, you can really set yourself up for extremely low living expenses now and massive cash flow in the future. So if you think house hacking is right for you, let's talk a little bit about this. But I wanna share a couple stories with you. First off, one of my best friends uh, all the way through high school and in college, and we're still friends today, he did this in college. So he went to um, Arizona State and uh, ASU and uh, he bought a four bedroom ranch style house pretty close to campus and he rented out the other three bedrooms and lived in the master bedroom himself. Well, the other three guys that were living in the house with him, their rent covered the whole property and he did this for four years. Uh, after he graduated college, he ended up just rent keeping the house as a rental, but he basically lived rent free through college while these other people were paying for his future rental property. Like it doesn't get any better than that. So that's what you could do with house hacking. I know um, several people that have a detached garage um, and they converted that into an Airbnb pro rental and people stay in there. I know people that rent their spare bedrooms on Airbnb and all these things can add up. Even if you're only able to get a couple hundred dollars a month, that's a couple hundred dollars a month you didn't have originally. So how can you make this work? What does it look like? Many young people shy away from real estate as a whole because you need 20 to 25% down payment to get a loan from the bank. However, when you're house hacking, you might be able to get away with a tiny down payment. And in fact, there are banks now, um, it's a little scary, but they're doing 0% down payments again. It's almost like 2007 all over again. But we talked to Rocky. Um, he is a finance blogger at 30 O, and he used a VA loan to purchase his first home. Um, the cool thing with the VA loan, it's a veteran's loan. Um, it's a, sorry, a loan benefit for veterans and active duty military, but it allows borrowers to put 0% down on their primary home. As Rocky went through the process, he paid for a few costs along the way, but on the day he bought his house, the seller refunded those costs, and he got over $300 positive on the exchange, so it worked out really well. After buying his house with zero dollars down, Rocky moved in with two friends who paid rent to him. And while he had two friends living with him, basically they covered almost everything except for $80. So Rocky only had to pay $80 a month towards his mortgage and he paid one third of the utilities because they split it three ways. So if you're considering house hacking, typically the best deals are VA and USDA loans. If you qualify them, these loans might have high upfront fees, um, but they require zero down payment. Borrowers may also want to consider a 5% down conventional mortgage, but I'm actually seeing lenders, like I said, that are doing 0% down loans. They also have FHA loans, um, and they have down payments as low as 3.5%, but they also do have ongoing fees and upfront fees. But if you're serious about buying your first rental property, you can compare mortgage interest rates, and we have an interesting, cool table on our site today. You can go to thecollegeinvestor.com slash episode 85, and you can find the best mortgage rates around and see what we recommend. So 
The important thing, though, is after you buy the house, you have to think of your house hack as an investment. Although it's fairly easy to get financing for a primary house, not every house is equally hackable. So, um, you know, Ruby Escalana and Peter, uh, oh man, I'm going to jack this name up, but uh, Peter P of Jacksonville, Florida, and they are bloggers at A Journey We Love. Um, they purchased a three bedroom, two bath townhome. Um, since they had actually been living with another roommate in a two bedroom apartment, they felt the townhouse was big enough to rent out. However, they decided that having Airbnb guests would work better than having a full time roommate. It's surprisingly very easy to fill up our house with guests. Yes. One reason they were successful is location. They're in an up and coming area. Everybody is wanting to move there and people are starting to flock there. By purchasing a larger house in a more desirable area, the Journey We Love bloggers have had a lot of success hacking their house. On average, their revenue from Airbnb guests cover 85 to 90% of their mortgages and costs. Plus, they get to deduct money on their taxes because they're effectively running a small business. If you go back to Rocky, Rocky mentioned that he had a similar investment mindset when he purchased his house. He purchased a four bedroom house and that he knew he could pass the 1% rule where the gross rent is at least 1% of the home's value. So that's a good rule of thumb. If you're going to invest in any type of rental property, the 1% rule is something to think about. So you want the gross rent to be at least 1% of the house's value. So, um, you know, if you're buying a $300,000 house, you probably want the gross rent to be about $3,000. Now that doesn't work everywhere. Um, you know, in some high income, high home value areas, there's a 2% and a 3% rule, but the 1% rule is pretty golden. If you can get a house that works on it. Um, Rocky also said when he bought the house, he knew he would share it with roommates. Um, he considered the layout of the common areas, how solid the bedroom doors were and other factors to make sure it was a place that he felt comfortable living even with a roommate situation. If you decide to purchase a multifamily home, you'll need to be sure that the house can cash flow if you decide to leave the property. Maybe you're going to take a new job or you want a different house. Um, so although using roommates to cut down on your living expenses can make a lot of sense, you do not want to be stuck in a property that is cash flow negative if you leave. Because things happen. You know, you might not have that house after five years or so and you don't want to be stuck in a negative equity and negative cash flow situation. So can anyone house hack? Um, Rocky explains that for many people, the idea of house hacking isn't financially impossible. It's socially impossible. And that's a really cool phrase and I love it. And that's why we're talking about it because house hacking you know, it's totally financially doable. I mean, a lot of us have spare rooms and places, and but we just don't necessarily want someone with us. Um, you have to be prepared to have some side eyes. Uh, Rocky says he's 32 and he's living with a roommate. Um, and so he gets a lot of people that just give him weird looks, but he says he's paying so little to live in this house that it helps achieve his financial goals. If you go back um, to... Ruby and Peter from A Journey We Love, they say the real secret to successful hacking is trusting people and being flexible. Uh, they advise that you need to think of it as a good financial tool. It can help you save a lot of money on your mortgage and you can spend that money elsewhere. Parents commonly object that raising kids makes house hacking impossible. Uh, you know, Hannah, our, one of our writers that put this together, says that she has firsthand experience that proves that's not the case. She bought her current home when she had a toddler, and they specifically bought a split-level house with a bedroom and bathroom in the basement so that they could reach out, uh, they could rent it out if they found the right person. Um, and after living at their place for just a week, they had a friend approach them to rent out their basement, and it was a perfect fit. And they've been living there now with their two kids, and his rent from the basement covers most of their housing expenses. So that is just a cool story. And it just shows that you can house hack in any situation if you are okay. I love that. If you want to be, if you want it to be, if you're okay with the social issues that come from house hacking. So House hacking math, guys. How does the math work? Like, how are you going to make this financially um, happen? So, if you're going to set out house hacking as a house hacking as a wealth building strategy, it's important that the money works out in your favor. In particular, you need to save money while you're living in the property and have the option to turn it into a cash flowing rental when you decide to move. 
you don't want to count on growing equity, especially in multifamily properties. So I think that's an important distinction. So a lot of people think that the goal of real estate is that you're going to just have all this equity growth and you're going to see your property values increase so much over time. And it's just this amazing investment. And that's the biggest myth of homeownership. The big thing that real estate investors understand is that equity is almost secondary to cash flow. Cash is king. You want to make money. You want to have cash flow on your rental properties. And equity is a secondary bonus that you get from your cash flow. And that's why people typically don't work do uh, don't do very well on owning their own primary residence. In fact, I just had our neighbor; they sold their house, um, you know, and I want to say they bought it for about two hundred thousand dollars in nineteen eighty, and they just sold it for seven hundred thousand dollars in two thousand eighteen. And while that sounds all fine and dandy, uh, they put in almost two hundred fifty thousand dollars in renovations over the years because they had to update their kitchen. No one wants to buy. Uh, 1980s kitchen anymore. So really, they were into the property for $450,000, and they sold it for $700,000, um, you know, not including all of the expenses and the interest they paid on their mortgage and any repairs they had to make over the years. Um, but what is that? Four hundred fifty-five, six. They, they made $250,000 um, on their original $200,000 investment, and who knows what their down payment was and everything, but over... I don't know, almost 30, 40 years almost. That is a really, really terrible return. So I want you to realize that it's not the appreciation that's going to help you. Um, it's going to be the cash flow. So there are three calculations you should do before you think about house hacking. The first one is the 1% rule. And we touched on this above, but the 1% rule states that a rental property should have a gross rent equal to 1% of the property's value each month. If a property is worth $100,000, it should have a fair market rent of 1,000 per month. If the property is worth 400,000, it should rent for 4,000 a month. Um, since you're planning to live in this property, the property doesn't have to achieve the full 1% rule with you living in it. Instead, you should evaluate the property as if you were going to rent out the whole property to a third party. Um, depending on where you live, that 1% rule might be impossible to achieve. That's when it might make sense to look at multifamily rentals. Um, but also, you know, the, like I said, there's the 2% rule, there's the 3% rule. People have made variations on this for different uh, markets. If you're planning to rent out the property on Airbnb, you need to make a conservative estimate on your occupancy and rental rate as well. You can't assume you'll have visitors 30 days a month all paying full price, right? Like it's Airbnb. You might be able to book 10 days a month, five days a month, so on and so forth. So the next thing you need to think about is the cap rate. Now we're getting really kind of technical when it comes to uh, real estate. But if you find a place that passes the 1% rule, it's time to see if your property has a positive net operating income. Uh, and this number, the cap rate, shows how much cash you can expect to earn after you've paid off the mortgage. And we break down the full calculation here. Um, but, you know, really, if you're living in this unit, and you're going to house hack, you should calculate your cap rate based on living in the property too. You can use the same equation, but instead of expected rental income based on the fair market value, consider what you did actually expect to charge your tenants or your roommates. So if you have two roommates who you charge $400 per month, your net rent rental income would be $800 per month or $9,600 per year, and you could use that amount to calculate your cap rate. And we break down the full formula for operating income uh, there. Um, you know, and the cap rate you need to achieve really depends on your goals for the property. For house hackers, a cap rate of around three to four percent with the actual rent makes sense. Um, you know, if you are an aggressive investor, you might seek something closer to seven or eight percent. Um, but really, if you're three to four percent cap rate on something that you're house hacking, that's cool. Uh, finally, if the cash, uh, cap rate works in your favor, it's time to consider if this property, um, uh, it's really time to consider this property for your house hack. In general, renter, rental property investing, like I said, is about cash flow. It's not about equity growth. So you need to focus finally on earning cash month in and month out. Uh, I recommend calculating cash flow in two ways. The annual cash flow based on the actual rent you expect to receive from the roommate or tenants. This number might be negative, but it'll give you a good idea of how much you're actually paying.
pay for housing. Um, next, you could calculate the actual cash flow if you weren't living in the property. Um, and by figuring out both, you can kind of see what would happen if you moved out or if you were going to use the whole thing as a rental. Um, as rental rates rise in your area, your cash flow will also rise with them in most cases. So you don't need a huge amount of cash flow to start. But an ideal place to be is you probably want a cash flow of at least $100 per month um, per property. But of course, higher is better. Remember, since you plan to hack the house and live in the property for several years, you might be okay accepting a smaller monthly cash flow, but be careful with this. It's pretty easy to overestimate your operating expenses, especially if you are not a full-time real estate landlord, investor, so on and so forth. Um, So a small amount of cash flow could quickly be eaten up by unexpected expenses, vacancies, repairs, and more. All right, so can you hack your house? This is something that you've considered. Do you already do it? Do you rent out your house on Airbnb? Did you have something you set up to rent out? I'd love to hear from you. Like this is something that really is interesting to me. Um, I think it's a cool way to make some money on your single family primary residence. Um, you know that a lot of people don't consider, but more people probably should consider doing. All right, guys, if you have a comment, go to to collegeinvestor.com slash episode 85. I'd love to hear it. I'd love to hear your thoughts on house hacking. I'd love to hear, um, you know, anything you're thinking about the subject. And of course, you can go to the website and you can see all the equations and the math and how it all works out. All right, guys, thank you very much. And I will talk to you next time.